We're really excited today to have as our guest, Dr. Anthony Pinn, who um, is a professor in Houston, right? You're yes. Where you are. And um, I was spent some time with his website. He has written about 500 books, as near as I can tell, <laughs> on a range of topics, uh, ranging from liberation theology, African-American history and theology, the Black church, uh, racism, humanism, uh, just really exciting hip hop, all kinds of different stuff. So we're really excited to have you here today to, to share with us. And so welcome. Thank you. Glad to be with you. So you, I know, interact with Unitarian Universalists and with a whole host of other people. When you're talking about humanism, who are you thinking of? Well, I'm thinking about anyone who thinks in terms of a philosophy of life that is not centered on assumptions of the divine or trans-historical realities. So I'm hoping that uh, understanding of humanism catches a lot of folks. It should. One of your books is something I called something like um, how a good Methodist became a great atheist. Um, and so you, you've had a journey yourself towards this philosophy. What what would you say was an epiphany moment? I, maybe that's a, an inappropriate word to use when describing that. <laughs> but, you know, what, when did you say, wait a minute, things are different than I thought in terms of uh, theology? It, it, there, was, there wasn't a particular moment. Um, there was no aha moment. Uh, this transition for me took place over the course of some years. Uh, beginning uh, during my work as an undergraduate in New York and uh, was finalized uh, while I was beginning the PhD program in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it took place over a period of time. My, my belief in God softened over the course of those years. I went uh, to New York with um, a rather evangelical theology. God is on the throne and all is well. God breaks into human history and makes things happen. And by the time I left New York, I had a sense of, of a God who really is a, that small, still voice that tries to persuade us towards the good. But that understanding of God didn't really resolve issues for me. And these issues had to do with pain and suffering within the world. Uh, and so it reached a point where I had to make a decision. I could be a safe uh, safeguard for the tradition. I was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and was involved in ministry, or I could find a way to be more fully concerned with what's actually happening in the world. Um, and so I left the church, surrendered my ordination, and with time understood myself to be a humanist. May I ask, are the ideas of humanism and theism mutually exclusive, in your opinion? In, in my opinion, yes. They are mutually exclusive. So one can't be a full-on humanist and believe in God? Not as I understand humanism, no. Can you say more about that? Because I have heard one humanist say that they're not mutually exclusive, so I'm curious your... Um, perspective that, I mean, I think they are too, but I'm curious as to your perspective. Well, I, I tend to abide by definition provided by the American Humanist Association, which has to do with humanism as a philosophy of life without any supernatural claims, without any attention to trans-historical possibilities, and most importantly, without God or gods. So kind of understanding humanism that way, it is by definition impossible to link that with theism. So what do you think is the difference between humanism and atheism, or, or how, how do those two words interact? Well, I, I think with atheism, you get this central claim, there is no God, right? This is a fight against the idea of God. For me, humanism is more useful because it not only tells us, it not only says what I don't believe, but it gives a sense of my larger commitments. Whereas with atheism, the moral and ethical vision isn't found in the term. With humanism, I'm hard pressed to kind of think about that philosophy of life without some attention to morals and ethics. So I'm really curious, um, 
about so many things, but I'm going to try to word this. So with all of your focus on suffering and especially the suffering of black people and other people of color and um, locating hope in humanity can be difficult. I mean, especially when you include white people in humanity, which sometimes seems debatable, but um, I'm curious, do you locate hope in humanity or do you just locate ultimate meaning there? Well, let me provide a little context. So I, I'm, I'm still a theologian. Much of my work is still theological. I think you can do theology without uh, attention to gods or gods. But I do think my, my primary concern with issues of suffering and misery requires me to surrender certain theological categories. So I've surrendered the category of God. I've also surrendered the category of hope. It's not the language that I use. And for me, I've, I've moved beyond hope because from my vantage point, hope is too intimately connected with outcome-driven approaches to change. And without, without the assumption of this grand force out there that keeps us right and is consistent when we aren't, without this force that does work with us, I, I'm hard pressed to see the basis for an outcome driven approach. Humans are just too messy. We're capable of great good, but we do great harm. Um, every yes to life, we tend to counter with a strong no to life. And so this outcome driven approach for me isn't very useful. And so instead of that, I'm concerned with process with struggle, that I think something of our humanity is found in our very effort to say no to injustice, despite what might happen as a consequence of that no. That something about our effort to limit harm in the world, something about that speaks to liberation and to freedom. Um, but I'm also mindful of the fact that it's unlikely that any of this effort will ultimately win the day. We will find new ways to harm the world and to harm each other. And so we continue to struggle against that. But hope is not a term that I, I, I've continued to employ. It's really interesting because um, Asia and I, and I can't remember who else was there. We were, we were at the Middle Collegiate Church Revolutionary Love Conference um, this spring, and Miguel de la Torre was there um, talking about um, about hope and where that centers in revolutionary love work, and where in in many ways I, I there were a lot of folks of color, you know, in the in the room who really had a hard time with that concept, that that hope was not what was going to get us towards freedom um, because folks felt, some folks felt very much that hope is what had kept, what keeps them alive, is what gives them resilience, is what their theology is based on, is what their spirituality is based on. And, um, I, and I, Aisha, I don't remember if it was you or who it was at, at the microphone was talking about kind of almost the cheap grace or the cheap hope um, that that has kind of become turned into this this almost meaningless um, word or, or thought that doesn't allow for that transformation now that you're talking about and um, and it's something that that I wanted to to hear more about because I think that there is something there about um, also the deep spirituality of hope and resilience, um, but also the thought that that's not going to get us to liberation. Yeah, uh, Dr. De La Torre and I we're we're good friends, and I think on this point we disagree. Um, that. I see him maintaining that underlying impulse, but rejecting the way it's named, right? So it seems to me for him, the way in which this terminology of hope has functioned has been too easily connected to a lack of activity, right? A reliance on something other than ourselves, that it has short-circuited praxis. But I'm suggesting something very different that even that underlying impulse that we name as hope is inappropriate. 
So what would you say instead? Because I'm feeling like, I, so we can't ask you the question, what gives you hope? Because you are rejecting that very notion. And so what is it that, uh, what is it about the process or what, what is, is it black liberation theology? What is it that insert different word that is optimistic or at least something that is, oh, Jessica seems to know. I, I feel like I want to try to pass the test here. <laughs> <laughs> what do I remember? Um, and, and I think one of the things that I, that I took away um, from Dr. Penn's class was this idea that when, that the, the um, purpose is meaning making, you know, and, and that um, when something ceases to have meaning, like God is a construct that ceases to have meaning anymore. And so we don't use it anymore. And then hope, like it ceases to have meaning in a lot of applications. And so we don't use it anymore. And, and so instead of hope, we have the, the quest for complex subjectivity. <laughs> Oh, you the did a million the dollar phrase. <laughs> yeah, I would just, I would fixate on struggle. And again, all of this other terminology points to something I have to reject. And that is an outcome driven process. For me, struggle is sufficient. So talk about the, um, Complex intersubjectivity. Oh, that complex means, subjectivity. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Because I read that you said that that really is, is the center of what you think black theology is. Did I get that right? No, of uh, uh, religion. <laughs> okay, I got the whole thing wrong. Now, my mind has changed some on this. And so I a, a book that I recently finished that rethinks some of this, but I'll just go back to Terran Triumph, the, the book that kind of outlines this. And my argument was, that religion isn't something in and of itself. That religion is really this quest for complex subjectivity. It's the human effort to wrestle with the fundamental questions of our existence. Who are we? What are we? When are we? Why are we? And that you don't really get then at religion by looking at rituals, by looking at institutions, by looking at doctrines and creeds that this is all the historical manifestation of this much deeper impulse. And this impulse is this desire to make meaning. My argument would be liberation theologies have fallen short, that they tend to be, they tend to champion tradition over against experience. Right, that, I'll, I'll give an example that a, a, whether it's explicitly stated or not, at the center of liberation theology is this issue of theodicy. What can one say about God in light of human suffering in the world? To the extent liberation theologies, it really doesn't matter the geographic context, are concerned with human suffering and misery, and they are theistic, they have to wrestle with this question. But in wrestling with that question, they dismiss out of hand certain possibilities. Liberation theologies don't entertain a demonic God, a God who really doesn't like racial minorities. They don't entertain the possibility of a passive God who just says, hey, you folks have messed this up, you figure it out. They have privileged a certain understanding of God despite the historical evidence. One of our own, William R. Jones, raises this in Is God a White Racist? Yeah, that the historical evidence easily suggests that God doesn't like Black people. But liberation theologians, Black liberation theologians, have dismissed that without struggling against it. And so from my vantage point, they've chosen the tradition over the people. So the question is, struggle inherently has meaning or doesn't? I'm, I'm saying struggle is our effort to foster meaning. Well, you can't have meaning without struggle. That, that's one of the things that I've been um, most frustrated with, with, with it, within my Unitarian Universalist context is people want a spirituality without working on social justice. And to me, it's like, then you just want a country club. This is, you can't have... Me, to me, I, I don't think you can have make meaning without struggle. It's empty. It's like uh, Christina said, it's cheap, great. It's 
it's Oprah. It's it's making people feel good without working through something. I mean, the most shallow people I know have had what what I would say on the surface, relatively stable lives, lived in the same, you know, not had struggle. And I, I mean, I would imagine that the meaning making comes from struggle and you can't, you're not going to have the same kind of deep meaning of who we are, why we are without struggle. Well, that- I, I wouldn't go that far, right? That I, I would argue that, sure, people who are not engaged in social justice activity can still have meaning. Now, my my judgment on that would be it's a truncated and limited meaning, but for them, it is still meaning. Again, I would just say it's it's truncated and it's a meaning that is fostered at the expense of the world. Do you think God as a metaphor is useful or harmful or both? I, I think it, it is language that we just need to get rid of, that it does us no good. It isn't helpful. Let's get rid of it. And let's come up with a vocabulary and a grammar that actually speaks to and from our experience. Right, that this notion of God, no matter how much we massage it, still begs certain questions that we cannot answer in a way that is sufficient. And I'll go back to this issue of theodicy. What can you say about God in light of human suffering in the world? What can you say about God in light of sexism? What can you say about God in light of homophobia, in light of racism, in light of classism? Theists cannot answer that question in a satisfying way. Something has to be surrendered. Something has to be given up. And there are some, there are some graphic responses that we've rejected, right? The idea, for example, that people, that people suffer because they have just messed up and God is punishing them. We tend not to move in that direction anymore. Well, depending on who you mean by we, yes. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of you use, right? I'm not thinking in terms of Southern Baptists. We, okay. we tend yes. not to think that way anymore. But that doesn't fundamentally solve the problem. What I worry about, if I may, and I, I promise I'll sure. stay quieter because I'm jumping in. Yeah, jump I mean, in. <laughs> my, my, what I, my experience of folks who, and I hear you about, I, 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 and I totally agree that sometimes the God, God language and the concept of God is not helpful. My experience has been those who've outright rejected God in the way that you are saying or rejected the concept of God um, lack humility. Then, then it turns into this um, folks that then don't embrace humility or the notion that um, there may not be God, but we still can't control the weather. We can't, there are things that we can't control. Um, we can control how we treat each other. Yes. And, and absolutely, we have seen humanity, humanity is capable of immense evil. However, how do you, I grapple with this notion of humility and how there's just so little of it from folks who embrace either humanism or atheism. And that, it bothers me because then it's like, that's not useful either. Yeah, I, I, I would alter it a bit. Um, it, it, it seems to me that one can make a reasonable argument that people, whether they believe in God or not, can lack humility, right? You can lack humility by thinking too highly of oneself, right? That one can lack humility by assuming they are in direct conversation with God and God has privileged them. That's the nature of life in the United States, right? A chosen people, a city on a hill. Where's the humility in this, right? So it seems to me, whether one is a theist or a non-theist, one can lack humility. I, I would argue that what you're pointing to within some humanist and atheist circles is a lack of wonder and awe. And I would say that is most certainly the case, that within humanist and atheist circles, there's often a limited attention, for example, to issues of ritual or community. The assumption being only the religious read theists are interested in ritual. We don't do that because we're not interested in meaning in the same way, right? Science undercuts that. But we are people in need of relationships, in need of connections, in need of ways of expressing and and remembering major life events. 
So we have a question from one of our viewers that I'll throw in here, John Camp. We love it when viewers ask questions. He asks, do world religions offer you any insight into human nature or ethics, such as the parables? At best, they are negative lessons, right? But I, I don't find traditional sacred texts particularly useful. They weren't written to me. And so I'm much more interested in the literary traditions of people like me who speak from a vantage point that is similar to my own, who've encountered human history in a way that is similar to the way to my encounter with human history. So rather than the parables, give me Zora Neale Hurston, right? Rather than rather than the Hebrew Bible, give me Camus. Now, is that of all for you? I noticed a couple of your books are about Nimrod and, and using that. Was that a powerful story for you and it ceased to be or how's that changed? Well, I, I think you can provide, I think humanism can also serve as a hermeneutic. That is to say, humanism can be a way of interpreting. And so my argument with the story of Nimrod has been that within the context of this Bible, our principles and insight, sensibilities that seem somewhat humanistic in nature. And so I think Nimrod has gotten a raw deal. That Nimrod has been demonized when from my vantage point, this is a person of honor, a person with vision, creativity, and insight. And that the problem in that story is God who would rather destroy than appreciate human creativity and the ability to bring together people with, a, with one vision, right? God doesn't, and according to that story, God doesn't like the idea that Nimrod has gotten these folks to cooperate on this project and they're reaching the heavens. So God creates chaos. In that story, God is the problem. With Nimrod, I see human potential, human possibility, and I wanna celebrate that. I'm also, deeply interested in the fact that Nimrod's project fails. What's important for me in that story is that moment of human creativity, that moment of human ingenuity. That's what we ought to be celebrating, but within the biblical text, it's rendered a problem. So I'm reading the Bible against the Bible. So... In, I want to go back a little bit to what you were saying about um, kind of deconstructing our language and our our thoughts about using language, God language. And so, I mean, 80% of the world's population is theist, um, give or take, in different types of theism. But so what do we say to to folks for whom their God um, has been life-saving and has has been restorative and has the church, which is where I'm going with this, and, and our churchly institutions have been the ones which have been life-saving for these four folks. Um, I'm thinking particularly in the, you know, the Latinx community and the Black community in which um, our church institutions and our belief in God um, really have been life-saving. Um, and so how would we, how would we shift that um, in a way that still connects people to what I would deem the holy? Um, but doesn't doesn't rely on that that cheap hope that cheap grace. Well, let's drill down a bit. I'd say a couple of things on that. One, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I appreciate the Constitution. What individuals want to do, I'm cool with. Right? That that is protected. Folks who want to go to mosque, to the synagogue, to the church, as part of their personal interactions, whatever, that's fine. My concern on, uh, with respect to that is, is the way in which these religious beliefs often become the lens through which we view public life. 
And for me, that is a problem. What folks want to do individually within the context of the religious community is fine, but that vocabulary, that grammar, those practices don't get to define the public realm. But the Trump like administration the is wrong. I'd also say this, that let's take the black church. The black church has been life affirming if you're a straight black male. It has not been life affirming if you're a black woman, if you're gay, if you're lesbian, if you're transgender, it has not been life affirming. These churches have been backwards when it comes to anything other than race. And so those who continue to hang out in these churches who are not straight black males have to sacrifice something of themselves in order to remain. I don't see how that's life affirming. If they want to do it, okay. But our conversation about these churches has to be more complex and has to recognize the ways in which they continuously fall short. Yeah, I, I absolutely support that and, and would no way hold up um, both the Black Church and the Catholic Church, uh, which is my uh, cultural background as um, shining examples of inclusion and, and life affirmation for everyone. Um, and I know within those contexts, the ways in which um, those institutions and Unitarian Universalism um, have been life-saving for some folks. And so that's that, um, that both and, you know, they, they, I can't support, I'm not a Catholic anymore, um, you know, the, the damage that is done in the name of those institutions. Um, but I can also recognize um, the lives that have been saved. Yeah, and I, I'd say again that um, for straight black men within the churches, there's a, there are ways in which these churches have been life affirming in a rather exp expansive sense. Outside of that group, they might be life affirming, but my question would be, what is the, what, is the context for and the framework for life. Right. And it seems to me it comes with a sacrifice. I'd also argue, and, and this isn't always popular, that for these institutions that are concerned with the well-being of populations, particularly populations beyond those who hold membership and give a tithe, one way to get at that is, for example, to pay property taxes. This is money that goes into communities and can be used to generate the kind of resource they say is necessary, right? That would be a worthwhile sacrifice on the part of religious organizations, pay property taxes. But so, I, so, so many of my black church friends talk about economic justice, right? And, and say, we've got to maintain our presence in these communities, but they're not financially supporting these communities. They get in their cars and they go home. They bulldoze dilapidated housing and build parking lots. They don't reconstitute housing. They don't pay property taxes in a way that would generate useful revenue. So I'm curious because it seems like you're saying beyond public life when you talk about this. So tell me if I'm overstating, it seems like you're saying that's not a path to liberation that you see for, for collective liberation, that, that beyond not wanting people to be dictating what all of us should do and calling it religious freedom, um, that kind of place that's liberating for some and oppressive to others is not going to get us where we want to go, not just in the public world, but in the congregation itself. Are, I, I also want to move away from this language of liberation because it's outcome driven, right? But my argument would be that participation in these organizations requires sacrifice. It truncates well-being. But can I, and, uh, why, why is outcome-based bad? Because why wouldn't we want to work toward an outcome? Is it just because it's impossible and, and untenable? It's an untenable situation. I mean, the word isn't, yeah. I mean, why, why not? I guess, I guess I'm curious as to, 
Yeah, I'd say a couple of things on, on that. One, more than atheism or humanism, it, it can have the undesired effect of creating complacency and nihilism. Because we've not, we've had outcome driven strategies, those have dominated, but none of them have worked. None of them have worked. The civil rights movement, sure, there were some gains, but if you look just at the financial picture for African Americans in 2018, where's the improvement? So what's the utility of this outcome driven strategy when those outcomes, we've never achieved them. So maybe, maybe rather than saying folks have fallen short and they're just not in the struggle the way they need to be, it's our fault. Now, maybe we need a different strategy. Maybe there's just something about the nature of injustice that isn't so easily dismantled. So let's just be about the work. Let's just struggle. Let's say no to injustice. And, and it seems to me that we have a better, uh, that the better way to get at this is through negation. I know what well-being cannot entail, right? It can't entail racism. It can't entail sexism. It can't entail homophobia, right? I, I know what it can't entail, but I, have, I, I don't know what well-being in and of itself looks like. I don't have examples of it, but I do have a pretty good sense of what doesn't lead us in that direction. Well, we have another uh, comment from uh, a viewer that um, maybe you can comment on. Ruth Reinhardt uh, writes, I come from an addictions ministry perspective as having believed that a personal relationship with a theist higher power saved me from active alcoholism and drug addiction many decades ago. Then during seminary, I found myself atheist and sitting with the experience of revisiting, reinterpreting mystical and spiritual experiences and sorting out how to companion recovery without that powerful higher power experience. So Ruth is wondering if you um, have something, uh, if you might be able to, to speak to this without a specific question, um, but that so many people from uh, who struggle with addictions and recovery view uh, that recovery is only possible through through relationship with a higher power, for example. I want to say a couple of things. So I, I want to respect the experience of folks. But I'd also want to point out this, that it seems to me what is of fundamental importance within those environments is the community. It's the ability to get together with folks who share your experience, who understand your context. They don't do those meetings in isolation. It's not you and your God off somewhere. Meetings are important. Community is important. And I would rather than highlighting this force that is supposedly out there, I would fixate on people getting together, the, the healing potential of community. Well, and I would say too, that the um, part of the problem with the current sort of addiction recovery uh, model that exists is that it is outcome driven and that recovery is actually a struggle, right? That you never come to the end. Like you don't get better. <laughs> you just continue to struggle. And so um, I think the idea of um, sitting in that process without any um, higher power who's going to grant you your magical day of freedom is actually more freeing and actually is the truth of the experience of recovery and is um, then, then it becomes meaning making. Then your whole journey of recovery is making meaning out of this, whatever this is and it's failure and success and over and over. Thanks, Jess. So I wanted to ask you about the, I think it's your, la your latest book, When Colorblindness Isn't the Answer. And it seems to be specifically talking about humanists' decision to wrestle and struggle or not with white supremacy. And so I'm interested in um, 
you, you said, as a first step, humanists should stop asking why so many racial minorities remain committed to religious traditions that have destroyed lives, perverted justice, and justified racial discrimination. So what should they be asking instead? Well, the better question is, why haven't humanist and atheist communities been more appealing to these folks? That's the better question, right? Even in terms of these religious traditions, it's, it's, the question is based on a rather narrow and uninformed understanding of, for example, the history of the black church. Right? Because it doesn't include figures like Sojourner Truth or Frederick Douglass or Henry McNeil Turner, who in 1895 argued God is a Negro and that the U.S. flag is a dirty rag until racism ends, right? It doesn't capture these sorts of folks. And, and so it, it, there's a complexity to these religious traditions that isn't captured at that question, but there's also a kind of self-righteousness that is extremely problematic. Why haven't humanists and atheist circles been more appealing, right? So I'll get people asking me that question and follow it up with, why aren't there more African-Americans in our circle? <laughs> right? so, it's because we don't offer them anything that is useful we don't give them a soft place to land and do you well, mean that in terms of meaning making or community or in i mean community you know? ritualization of life it, 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 so it, it seems to me we have to be clear on why african-americans who might have humanist sensibilities or principles continue to hang out in black churches. So if we think about it this way, black churches like Christian churches in the United States in general decline after the civil rights movement. Black churches see an uptick in terms of membership in the eighties and nineties. Now this is a population moving back into the black church that has played by the rules based upon the civil rights movement. They've gone to the right schools, they've moved to the right communities, they use English in a way that is non-threatening. They dress in a way that the dominant population can appreciate, but yet they still get slapped with racism and they've surrendered so much. So many of these folks go back to black churches and the sermon is the price they pay for community, for social networking, for economic opportunity, for a space in which they can just catch their breath and they don't have to explain why they're angry. What do we give them? Science education, separation of church and state, stuff they already know, right? So a critique of religion does very little for a population that is hiding out. They know it's inadequate. What's the alternative? Well, and I think that goes back to your, when what you were saying earlier about the sacrifice, right? Uh, to be in those communities, because they're conversely, they're for POC, there's a sacrifice to be Unitarian Universalist. And that sacrifice is, um, you know, kind of the converse of what you're talking about, is that there is that lack, in my my experience, that lack of, um, of ritual of, of life, um, you know, confirmation, uh, you know, all of those kinds of uh, milestone moments um, that that we have. And so how do we recognize the sacrifice within our own context um, and, and change it, right? So that, so that the folks that aren't coming to us who have a lot of what you're talking about um, in terms of seeking and, and like the community that they're coming into, but um, don't like sacrificing that part of themselves uh, in order to be Unitarian Universalists. It's a different sacrifice. Yeah. I, I, think, I think we, you use, uh, have missed opportunity. Um, and I'd say that in part because our orientation from my vantage point is off. For a population that says it's about deeds, not creeds, well, then Sunday is the least important day of the week. It's the least important day of the week. And too often when folks come to us on Sunday, there's very little that distinguishes that time together from the time together they're leaving. So what is uniquely you, you about our Sunday time together? It seems to me that 
based upon our preoccupation with our rightful preoccupation with deeds over creeds, the ministry looks more like coaching, right? It's, it's helping people kind of fine tune their moral and ethical vision and helping them kind of exercise those moral and ethical muscles in ways that are meaningful for them. So Sunday, would, Sunday then has a very different look. The pews or the chairs aren't set up the way they're set up at the Baptist church. The time together isn't like it is in the Methodist church because our very orientation is radically different. I think we've missed out on an opportunity to do what is uniquely us because we've been chasing after people who probably aren't going to hang out with us anyway, rather than making ourselves unique in a way that will attract those who are already like-minded. Sound like you're talking about the Democratic Party right now. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Just looking at recent elections and going, yeah. Anyway. So what do you see that um, humanists are doing? Because, I mean, I must admit that the humanist movement that I know is a very white movement. And um, and I'm I'm excited to hear you mention Bill Bill Jones, by the way, Dr. Bill Jones, who did so much for so many of us to wake us up 20, 30 years ago. Um, yeah, I miss him all the time right now. I'd love keep hearing him. Diagnosis determines treatment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but w- did you know him personally? Or? Yes, he was one of my mentors. I met him when I was a PhD student and we remained in touch um, until his passing. Yeah, great guy. Um, but so I'm curious what you what you've seen because you've been doing this for a while with you know in the humanist movement. Is there a black humanist movement that's a, a, an entity itself? Uh, you know, certainly the American Humanist Association, other organizations like that, as I know them, are very white organizations. Well, there are uh, predominantly African American organizations, right? Like Black Nonbelievers, African Americans for Humanism. There are a variety of uh, organizations that understand as their starting point the African American cultural experience, uh, where you don't see a whole lot of us in meetings like the American Humanist Association. Do you do you think that the American Humanist Association, or for that matter, the Unitarian Universalist Association, has come to an awareness that we can't go on the way that we have been, and um, I, you know, that that we've kind of, in some way, there are so many bottoms to hit. Let's just say there are many of them, but but that we have really come to a point where we can look at young people and know that who we are and what we do in many ways is of no interest to them. And um, people we want to engage. Do you, do you see it? Do you see people? Yeah. For me, them? that's a problematic reason. The need is a problematic reason. What I'm more interested in is the want. We want diversity as opposed to if we're going to survive, we need it. I don't even mean to survive like numerically and financially. I mean, ethically and morally, I guess, more than anything. I see those as interconnected within these organizations. Um, But I would argue that if we're going to diversify, if we're going to have more people of a despised color within these organizations, it requires a radical reworking of these organizations. Otherwise, what we're asking for are more shades of the same. And why should that be appealing? It requires a radical reworking. And here's the thing. It means the dominant population within these organizations will be uncomfortable. You can't have change and comfort, so pick. But I think there's a a basic question, a kind of no-brainer these organizations need to ask. What is it we really want? And if diversity isn't what these organizations really want, cool, be honest about it and let us go about our business. But if the answer is we want diversity, then be willing to make the significant changes necessary to become inviting. 
Can I ask if you um, are affiliated with the UU congregation and and if yes, why or why not? And do you consider yourself a UU humanist rather than just a humanist? I, I'm a I'm a humanist. I affiliated with First uh, Unitarian in Houston uh, over a decade ago, but I don't go. I, I don't find Sunday appealing. Right for me, it's a it's a light version of what I left, and, and I don't find that particularly useful. I find spending some time with my friends or just catching my breath on Sunday a more useful exercise than sitting in a church service that reminds me of my Methodist service, just no cross and no God talk. If you could wave a wand, um, what would a humanist uh, program service um, look like that would feed you? I'm curious to what imagine, what is in your imagination yeah. that is possible? Well, again, my argument would be based upon our self-understanding, Sunday is the least important day of the week. And so Sunday becomes an opportunity for coaching. This is what I would understand ministry to be and a reporting back with respect to your efforts and, and with respect to your deeds and the moral and ethical vision undergirding those deeds what went right? What went wrong? How do you need to re-strategize? And then you go about your business. But something more along those lines would be appealing to me than a traditional worship service without this entity to worship. What kind of ritual do you think would enhance that? Well, that would be the ritual, right? I want to, I, I, I make use of the thinking of figures like Ronald Grimes from ritual studies, that ritual is repeated activity and founded space. So that gathering, that reporting back is ritual. I see Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism actually doing a lot of that in their initiatives and their checking back and, and, um, creating a completely uh, radically different paradigm that encompasses actually a lot of what you're saying. So um, I, I used to say Black Lives of UU gives me hope. And now I feel like I, you just have blown my mind this whole hour. So I feel like I need more words. I, I don't know what to do with myself. I will be checking back with you, Dr. Pin, on my, what way you've coached me. So I thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the DRUM Global Majorities uh, Collective Initiative is really, along with Blue, um, I'm really, really hopeful to see um, what that brings and how that change, what how that changes the shape of our uh, practice. Um, I think that's, I can't wait. <laughs> I can wait. I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but I do love it. And I may have to quote you the, uh, you know, Asia and I talk a lot uh, when we're doing, when we're doing uh, work around the white supremacy teaching about comfort and, and our congregations, um, primarily white congregants who have this expectation of comfort and the, the, uh, you know, you, you can't have change and comfort. You got to pick one is so succinct as to um you know what we've been what we've been trying to trying to get people towards yeah have you been following the white supremacy teachings and everything within unitarian universalism no i haven't okay all right well then we won't go up that that avenue because it looks like you're writing books every day from a lot of <laughs> And you've also founded a center, it looks like, for engaged scholarship there. Yeah, it's the Center for Collaborative Engaged Learning, I think it's called. Can you describe uh, that? It's the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning. And it's our effort on campus to recognize critical thinking and effective communication strategies as the basis of education and to provide ways to enhance critical thinking skills and effective communication strategies, both on and off campus. So we work with high school students. We have a, a scholars in residence program, a variety of ways to try to get at those two things. 
And what do you learn from doing that? What have you been learning? Well, for me, it's it's obligation, right? When my grandmother sent me off to college, right? One of the things she told me was move through the world knowing your footsteps matter. For my grandmother, it was a matter of giving something back that that well-being, success isn't strictly premised upon your own comfort. It's utilization of your skills or your talents to benefit others. This is what I have. And so I share it. Rice has resource. So we share it. And one of the things I've learned through this is we're not necessarily within the academy. We're not necessarily aware of how siloed we are, how isolated we are. And the way that isolation affects how we think about the world, how we engage the world, what we understand as normative behavior and normative sensibilities and concerns, it just, it warps us. And it's not until we go off campus that we have a sense of how we've been warped. So the goal is to, is to encourage active learning to make certain both on and off campus, students have opportunity to take these ideas and see how they live. I can see why you and Sharon Welch are friends. (laughs) Yes, one of my mentors. I did coursework with her at Harvard Divinity School. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the same needs to be true of ministry, right? I mean, what you said about utilizing skills and talents to benefit others creates an economy of abundance, in my opinion. Giving is what creates abundance. And, and I feel like that's not our culture as a Unitarian Universalist overarching culture is a culture of scarcity and what's mine is mine and I need to be on this hierarchy and I need to if somebody else shines, it makes my shine less somehow, or, you know, and I, I just want, I'm about to do this big talk about this at GA, actually, <laughs> the Berry Street, which is about how we try to create this culture where we're, we're called always to be creating more by giving. And I, I'm curious, I mean, your grandmother, your, your naming is a real source of that for you. I, I'm curious where, do you see the students getting that from doing that? Does it become their source as the experience itself? It opens them to the world. They have a very different perspective on the world. They, they have a different appreciation for the importance of really good questions and the ability to probe for responsible answers. They, they engage the world in a very different way as a consequence of, of this contact. And so one of the things we also do is we bring we bring folks from the community on campus to teach regular courses in the curriculum. The idea and part behind this being, students need to appreciate the wealth of information, knowledge and know-how that isn't simply captured by a PhD. Can I ask Dr. Penn, do you identify the academy as a community for yourself that is, um, you know, a spiritual kind of community? I mean, one in which you can um, have that relationship that others might have in a church? Yeah, spiritual isn't language I would use. I know, I struggled um, saying that myself. <laughs> I was but like, I, I think of the academy as where I work and my community is something different. Now, there may be some overlap in that Some of my friends, the people I love and who love me, happen to be within the academy. But the academy is where I work. Do you don't use the word spiritual? No. I feel like we could go on for days. (laughs) Wait, we have two minutes left, and that's a huge thing. Do you what what word is is it struggle for meaning? What what language do you use where we where we meaning, awe, wonder? Okay. But spiritual doesn't, doesn't work for me. Yeah. Interesting. Can I say, can I say one more thing? I, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but one of the best things that, the, that in the class that we came up with was, and we've used it throughout 
seminary now for the last three years is a hashtag called preach the pin. <laughs> anytime you are in a place of like where it's just the struggle and there's no end to it and you're just going to keep like grinding on the struggle, you go hashtag preach the pin. <laughs> <laughs> they are useful these days. <laughs> well, if you if people wanted to access your wisdom through one of your books, there are so many. Where would you suggest? Of course, they're different topics, so it's yeah. you know. But where's a, a nice accessible in terms of understanding the humanism that you've been talking about, which is how we frame this conversation? Which book would you point them to? Yeah, I, I think in terms of something that is meant to be reader friendly, you know, it drops the footnotes and that sort of thing. It's when colored blindness isn't the answer. It's great. It sounds like a good congregational read, actually. It's fabulous. Well, next week we have Marisol Caballero talking about the global majorities, which is Mar Marisol Caballero. Thank you. I knew I was just, I was like, oh God. <laughs> Sometimes Jorge laughs at me so hard when I say that. <laughs> I, I don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> Why don't you say the whole thing? Uh, next week we have Marisol Caballero from uh, DRUM, which is Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Ministries, talking about the uh, Global Majorities Project, which is really fabulous. It's coming into its second year, I believe, and um, we're just thrilled to hear the update. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Penn. This was, I think we'll all be like ringing like a bell for, for some days as we, as we um, unpack this. I have like notes about when you said what. what. I might be doing stuff different in worship here in New York. So <laughs> I, I have taken notes. <laughs> yeah. My mind is so blown right now. I just need like another cup of coffee to just get my brain together just it's early in, where you are too in, in so. honor it is early <laughs> well thanks for letting me hang out i've enjoyed our chat it's been great i hope you'll come back sometime anytime all right thank you so thank you, you.